and welcome to St Paul's Church at Brewer. My name is Bess and I'm a training lay minister or reader here at St Paul's. So welcome to this pre-recorded service from St Katharina's Church in Dallasburg on this special Sunday morning. It's a continuation of our Christmas celebrations and yet we are on the cusp of a new year. In order to participate today, you'll need to download a service sheet from the website. And you might need to pause the service now in order to do that. I hope you all enjoyed being with us today. So we're wrestling with a difficult part of the Christmas story. But let's begin by remembering our wonder at the God who enters our world. Please say the words in bold together. Lord Jesus Christ, your birth at Bethlehem draws us to near and wonder at heaven touching earth. Accept our heartfelt praise as we worship you, our Saviour and our eternal God. Amen. The choir now leads us in Once in Royal David City. When we've closed our minds to new possibilities, 
refusing to take the risks of exploration, saying no to the adventure of mission. God who is for us, forgive us and help us start again. When we have hoarded what we have, keeping our resources under lock and key, refusing to share the abundance of God's generosity. God who is for us, forgive us and help us start again. Merciful God, you love all that you have made and welcome us with open arms even when we fall short of your purpose for us. Forgive us our failings and help us to begin again, made whole by the embrace of your love. Amen. And as forgiven, faithful people of God, we sing together, O come, all ye faithful. Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as we prepare to hear the story of the Magi visiting Jesus, we sing together, We Three Kings of Orient are. taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. 
When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. I'm aware that we're looking at a difficult passage this morning, and I think we're doing so because it's important not to gloss over some of these passages in, in Scripture. It's easy, isn't it, just to think of Christmas as a, a fairy tale. It's all fairy lights and tinsel and wonderful. Uh, this story uh, reminds us actually that Christmas has a very, very serious side to it. It's difficult too, isn't it, because I know from my own experience in pastoral ministry that walking alongside those who have lost a child is really difficult for them uh, and it takes a long, long time. Uh, and therefore it, it's a costly path for those people that have to walk in. Uh, and I'm aware that therefore thinking about this topic is going to be really, really difficult for some people. On the service sheet there is a video link. Uh, on that uh, video, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the, tree, and the Chief Rabbi uh, talk about their own personal experience of loss, uh, losing a child. Uh, you might find it helpful to uh, look at that or maybe to watch it to understand a little better some of the emotions that go on. Uh, and I think I want to say uh, right at the start that if this is something that really touches you today, then please, please do... Uh, come forwards, talk to Nathan or I, we're very happy to listen, to talk with you, to pray. Um, and uh, this isn't a burden that you have to carry alone. It, it, it's not a solo path that you have to walk. But I think also it's a really, really important passage uh, because I think looking at passages like this in scripture enable us to develop a, a really, really robust faith uh, we can stand against those who uh, say that you can't believe in a God because if there was a God, then God isn't good if it allows difficult and terrible things to happen. So I think it's really important, isn't it, that we look at passages like this to see whether they help us to strengthen our faith uh, so that we're resilient in the face of the questions, but also maybe resilient in the path that some of us are having to walk. So having said that, let's look at uh, the passage in the story itself that you'll find in Matthew chapter 2. On one level, it's a very simple story. It's about power, using power to maintain power. We know, don't we, that Herod uh, was a ruthless man. We have many records of this from uh, Roman records and others that he was somebody that would do anything to maintain his grip on power. He wasn't above murder, he wasn't above putting aside members of his own family. His grip on power was absolute and, and anybody or anything that threatened this was dealt with ruthlessly. And so it's not surprising when we see in the Bible passage that thwarted by the Magi, uh, who didn't go back and say, this is who he is and this is where you'll find him, that thwarted by them, uh, he takes very, very uh, strong measures. He isn't going to tolerate any other child that claims to be king. Uh, and he gives himself a wide margin 
uh, of uh, two years just to make sure that any possible uh, male child that could be um, the, the king or even a rumour of a king isn't there to threaten him and his reign and power. He clearly wasn't uh, that much of a popular king if he is threatened by even the thought that a baby uh, might be better at his job than him, but that doesn't enter into his mind. It is ruthless. I will do away with any hint of threat to my role. Some of the commentaries that I read uh, said, well, just for us to get a picture, uh, it was only 20 boys probably in Bethlehem that, was, uh, that were killed. I was slightly shocked by that phraseology, only 20, as if how, somehow that makes it any better. Even if it was just one other child, that would have been one too many. Let's not somehow uh, make ourselves feel any better about the, uh, what he did. Not at all. This is something that's terrible. And even taking the life of one innocent would have been one too many. Now, I don't think that that's the point in trying to make us think, oh, well, it wasn't maybe as many as if somehow that makes it any better. This is a horrible story of a ruthless person in power doing everything that they can uh, at whatever the cost. It, it's for us a demonstration as if uh, we are unfamiliar from more recent times, but what evil can look like. This is uh, evil personified in that lust for power uh, and doing anything that is necessary to ensure that that continues. It's a difficult tale. And there's no shying away from it. And the Bible doesn't shy away from the fact that we do find evil in its pages. And often evil that just gets told and not commented on. But I think that there is more to this story. And we'll just explore it a little bit more as we go along. If on the one hand it's the story of Herod and his... Uh, use of power and abuse of power, we also see that it's the story of God too, and God who comes as a rescuer in the midst of all of this. So you'll read, if you've got your Bibles in front of you as you look down, that it is an angel sent by God that comes to Joseph. Uh, we've already had uh, in our Christmas story so far examples of Joseph's real obedience, and this is another one. The angel comes and says, flee, flee, uh, and in words kind of reminiscent if you've been watching uh, those kinds of films of Gandalf and uh, on the uh, the bridge of Kazakh, uh, Kazakh doom, flee you fools, flee. Um, and you just get the impression that the angels come to Joseph and Mary and just said those words, flee, flee. You didn't go. It, it's imminent. It's urgent. You need to do it now. You can't just be grieving for what you're losing in terms of your family or your country or your livelihood. Just flee flee. And Joseph, to that very, very difficult instruction, is totally obedient. Totally obedient. His faith and trust in God just speaks so loudly, doesn't it, from the pages of scripture. As he gathers uh, their, their young child, we don't know exactly how old it is, but we do notice that they're in a house by this stage. They're no longer uh, wherever they were before when Jesus uh, was first born and Mary, and they go off presumably some tools of his trade um, and things like that, so that he's got something he can do when he gets to Egypt. But of course it's a story of God's rescue, isn't it? That uh, here God is sending an angel to say, look, I'm going to rescue the rescuer. It's a wonderful kind of twist, isn't it? We'll hear so much more uh, in Jesus' life, and particularly when we get to Easter and his death about that wonderful act of rescue. And here it's... Uh, the rescuer being rescued. Uh, and what we see also is that God, Jesus, God the Son, becomes a refugee. I, I don't want to dwell on that at, at all this morning uh, because it's not really what I want to explore, but it's just that wonderful thing, isn't it? Uh, when we think about strangers and, and immigrants and refugees, here is Jesus a refugee having to go to a country where he won't speak the language, where who knows what their living was like and how precarious it was. Handy that he had some gifts to take with him, admittedly. But just that idea of what it means 
uh, to be a refugee and to, to dwell in that human experience of lost and uh, confusion and having no roots and knowing where you belong. And so that's the story in a nutshell. It is, on the one hand, it, it, it is this personification of evil and power and the way that has been used. And on the other hand, a God who rescues uh, and who God, even in the midst of really difficult human situations, God is there at work and that can be an encouragement. But I don't know about you, but this story raises two really, really important questions for us. Uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time exploring just those two questions. And they're hard questions, and I think it is important that we give it just some thought and time. The first question. Did these children die just because of Jesus and him being born? The argument goes, had Jesus not been born, these children wouldn't have died. Uh, and therefore, in a sense, he is the cause of their deaths. To ask that a little bit more philosophically, uh, the question would be, is God the cause of suffering and injustice in human society? You can see how reading this story might help some people come to that conclusion, that that is what really God is like. And that if there is suffering and work and pain in our world, it's God's fault. So let me explore this because I think it's so important to see the story in its wider context. Let me give you some biblical context. Uh, there is the story of Cain and Abel uh, and Cain who, who murders his own brother because of the threat to him. Uh, and God's favour and God's goodness. Uh, you see that right at the beginning of the, of the Bible story of human history. Uh, you see some terrible other things as well. Uh, you see in the times of Pharaoh, we have that recorded for us in uh, the beginning of the book of Exodus, how the uh, Egyptian pharaohs uh, stopped all Hebrew children and Hebrew boys from, from living. Uh, and they were just systematically killed. Uh, and this attempt to do away with, uh, with children, in a sense which uh, pre, uh, in a sense points to and prefigures the story that we've read this morning. There's the story of David and Goliath, where uh, David is God's anointed king. And you can see where I've, I'm going uh, with this, can't you, just by picking up this story. Uh, David is God's anointed king, uh, the one from whom Jesus will later be called uh, the son of David. And Goliath comes against him to kill him, to kill him and to destroy God's people. It's a consistent story through uh, the scriptures that there are those who uh, hate God and God's people and will come against them to destroy them and particularly to destroy that line that we read about in Luke's gospel and the genealogy of Jesus and Matthew's gospel chapter one, that line which go, which traces uh, Jesus uh, from uh, David and right all the way back to Adam because they want to do away not just with God's people, but particularly God's anointed one, the one the prophets uh, look forward to, to say he will overcome all of these things. They want to do away with him. And of course, we see that in Jesus's life, don't we? That actually uh, evil finally has its way when Jesus is uh, arrested, tortured and crucified and killed by the Romans. What has been a, a, a thread throughout, in a sense, uh, the biblical story up until that point, that those who are against God will do everything to uh, destroy not just God's people, but particularly God's anointed, seems to come to fruition at that moment. Uh, and it seems that those that stand uh, against God and, and also Satan, who is behind so much of this, come back to that later, um, seem to have that moment of victory at the crucifixion. But of course it's carried on, hasn't it? It's not just, uh, it's not just 
pointing to Jesus and God's anointed. It's also God's people. Uh, and therefore we can see that uh, throughout history, the continued persecution of the Jews and also in different places, God's own people. Uh, and we see that in, in modern times. Um, we went to Thessalonica uh, earlier this year and uh, we had a very, very lovely conversation uh, with Catherine before we went uh, around what had happened at the end of First World War in uh, uh, Thessalonica and the Jewish quarter and the Jewish museum there. Of course, we're very, very familiar, aren't we, with again that attempt at destruction uh, by the Nazis in World War II, just in a sense of trying to wipe the face of uh, Judaism, or, or, or certainly out of Europe. And, and we see it in other parts of the world, uh, particularly in communist China and Russia, uh, when they sought to persecute anybody of, the, of Jewish faith or anybody who was a practicing Christian believer. God's people were to be done away with. It's not a new, new story. It's something that's been right there since the beginning of time and seems to continue into our modern worlds. And therefore that's why the experience of Jesus and his crucifixion shouldn't be a surprise to us. But as much as this is the story of God's people, I think we also and a story that's played out in human history, and if you are one of those who's experienced that, can be personally really, really difficult. It's not just a story played out in human history. And I think that's important that we see that although here in this story there is the use and abuse of power, that it is the innocent who suffer, that it is those who can't, uh, in a sense, protect themselves, who are often the victims, even though they might not see as though they've done anything. There is a bigger picture. And that bigger picture is given to us by Revelation chapter 12. It's probably worth, uh, if you're listening, you are listening to this on a video, aren't you, to actually just pause at a moment and maybe just read Revelation chapter 12. Uh, and then you can see how so much of the imagery of Revelation chapter 12 uh, seems to be around what we see in Matthew chapter 2. Uh, and what that does is it tells the story of a woman who is about to give birth, who is crowned with stars uh, and moons, and then the dragon, uh, or the biblical serpent in a sense, you can already begin to hear, can't you, echoes of Genesis 3 and the serpent. And it is the dragon who is there waiting uh, as uh, the late, as the woman goes into birth pains and, and is giving birth to the baby, the dragon is there wanting to devour and snap it up uh, and to make sure that actually that uh, the infant that is going to be born, that will rule, uh, and we're told that, that we, it, in Revelation 12, will rule, um, is destroyed before it has a chance. And there is also in chapter 12, you know, that that baby is whisked away and taken over heaven and taken into heaven. Uh, what it's saying, I think, is that in all of these stories, there is not just a human story going on, but there is a spiritual battle going on. Uh, and therefore, what we see in a sense is a little bit of this story to help us see the personification of evil, that there is Satan behind all of this, uh, somebody who wants to uh, stand against us and stand against God and influence and shape and damage and do whatever they can to stop God's plan from coming into place. But of course, we know also from Genesis chapter 3 that this child to be born will crush the snake. Uh, and that's why uh, we have the wonder, isn't it, of the Easter story, because just when it seems that this dragon or this snake or Satan had overcome and finally God's anointed is there dead and crucified, <laughs> then actually God raises him from the dead to triumph over sin and death and evil and to say to that dragon, your day is done. You will never uh, conquer this world. It will never be yours. 
So there is a spiritual struggle. And there are people who will flock to both sides. There are those who will love to run to the side of uh, the dragon and do all that they can to destroy others, to use power for their own glory, um, rather than to use it to serve for God's glory, to use it to look after themselves rather than others. Just as there will be others who flock to the side of the Lamb, who understand that if they endure and continue to love, then actually um, they will overcome. As Revelation says, they will be uh, uh, clothed in the finest white and gold robes. They will be seen to be pure and lovely. Why is this helpful? Well, I, I think it's helpful because it just answers that question with a really strong no. Is God the source of human suffering and evil? And the answer is no. God is the one who comes amongst us to share and experience and to actually die on the cross to do something about it. God is not the origin of our comfort and pain, uh, sorry, uh, of the suffering and pain that we see in the world. And, and I think that that is a helpful thing to know, isn't it? Because actually if uh, the trials that we go through, uh, if the struggles that we go through, we turn around and say, well, God has, uh, God has given this and is the source of this, then actually um, it, it becomes shattering, doesn't it? But actually if we think that God is on our side, helping us, wanting us to resist and endure and to overcome evil, it, it, it makes our struggles uh, completely, completely different, doesn't it? And whilst particularly, it, it wouldn't have been, uh, in, a, in a sense, a comfort for those uh, particularly who were having to go through this, it is a comfort, isn't it, to know that God will overcome uh, and God is on our side. So what about the second question? I think this is potentially a much harder question, actually. We see there, don't we, that Matthew tells us that uh, some of the, uh, what he tells us, and then he quotes some of the Old Testament, he says, this is to fulfill this. Put it another way, he's saying, look, God knew this was going to happen, uh, and he told us about it beforehand. So the question would be, well, if God knew it was going to happen, why didn't he stop it? Do you see, that's a really, really profound uh, question about the nature of God's. Because if God didn't stop it, the accusation would be, well, either God doesn't care, that's one accusation, or the flip side is he does care, but he couldn't do anything about it. God is impotent. Particularly if you read some of the Philip Pullman novels, um, you'll see that that's his uh, perception of, of God. That God does care, but actually God is old, God is past it, God is impotent in the face of what is going on in, in the world that God created. It's a really, really strong accusation, isn't it? Um, there in his Dark Materials trilogy, but also by many other philosophers and writers. So how do we respond to this, to the question, God, are you cruel <laughs> or are you just incapable? And I just want to say as well again that actually if this is a personal issue for you, then please, please don't feel that actually this is something that you have to walk with alone. Because it's all very well saying, well, yes, I believe in God, uh, it, it has the power to rescue, but why didn't he rescue my child? That's a really, really hard question to live with and to walk with. And just encouraging you, if you're still wrestling with this, to some extent, the philosophical arguments won't actually help you um, with that grief. They will be a comfort, yes, but... Don't feel that this is a path that you have to, to walk alone. 
do speak to Nathan or I. We're very happy to spend time with you and listen. Uh, Miriam also uh, heads up our prayer ministry. She'd love to, to pray with people for whom this is a particular struggle. So don't feel that you have to, to deal with these questions, big as they are, on your own. So how do I respond to the, that question, you know, God, are you cruel or God, are you just not up to it anymore? Uh, I think there are two things that I want to say in response to this. I, I've hinted at the first one already. Uh, and that is the story of Jesus. Jesus entered into our world. We see right from the start of his life that that wasn't going to be an easy life. They're trying to kill him. Well, he's still a, a, a babe in arms or even a toddler. They're out against him. But actually we see that even as he lived into adulthood and he taught and healed and fed and forgave and did amazing, amazing things for people, actually he came into our world to take upon himself all the anger, and hatred and evil in the world. Uh, we see that a little bit possibly hinted at uh, in some of the gifts to him that are gifts associated with death, possibly, uh, certainly wealthy gifts. But actually, Jesus on that cross didn't just kind of die because he said, well, I understand what it is to suffer and let me show you that I'm sharing your sufferings. Uh, he, he died so that actually he would accomplish something with his death. Uh, and by being raised to, to life on that glorious, glorious Easter Sunday, uh, then actually he was able to overcome sin and death and evil and say, it's day, it's done, the battle is won. Um, victory is accomplished. So Jesus entered our world to deal with the very things that we struggle with with the cruelty the pain the suffering the way in which actually it seems that uh, it is always the innocent and those that have least that seem to suffer the most god isn't a, a god who is remote and looking in from the outside he is a god who came to share in our humanity to uh, empathize with us deeply but also to make a difference to rescue us from this broken and suffering world. And it just isn't that good to know. It's not that God is cruel, far from it. God is coming to take upon himself um, human cruelty and to do away with it. Amazing. But of course, it is difficult, isn't it? that we are in a waiting time. We'd love to see that victory over sin and death accomplished. We'd love to be in that time or that Isaiah talks about, that there will be no more pain or suffering, there will be no more tears, or that wonderful uh, future that Revelation points to, that God will walk among us and we will be his people and he will be our God uh, and there will be nothing to, to, that comes between us. But we're not actually at that moment yet, are we? And therefore, we have to struggle. And it is at times a real struggle. And at times, it can be really, really painful. But it's good to do so, isn't it? Because we're doing so in the knowledge, actually, that there's nothing that we go through that Jesus himself hasn't experienced. Uh, as the scriptures say, God won't give us anything more uh, than actually we can, that we can uh, put up with, that we can endure. And God promises that he gives us his spirit. He will be with us in this and through this as we get through the other side. I think that's such an important thing to know, isn't it? But the second thing I think is that I just want to take us back to Revelation 12 because I do think that is such an essential perspective with which to read this story. And when Satan... Uh, in uh, chapter 12, in the, the embodiment there is a dragon. Uh, and I do say that, I want to say that there is uh, Satan, it's very, very real, there is this personification of evil. But, but when um, Satan marches, in a sense, to the throne room of heaven, <laughs> he is confronted by the archangel, uh, the archangel Michael. 
and it is Michael who fights him and we're told that it's Michael who flings him to the ground uh, and he is, uh, 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 as he's expelled from his kind of uh, heavenly realms. Why it, it, is that important? Uh, I think it's important for several reasons. One is to know that actually, uh, you know, here we have in some really good picture language, just the assurance that the dragon, the serpent, Satan, will be thrown down, has been overcome. And although uh, skirmishes continue, but actually there is no doubting the outcome of the battle. But also just to reflect for a moment. The dragon isn't God's equal. It's not like evil comes into the presence of God or goodness and that the two are equally, uh, equally matched and equally opposing. No, it is, it is Michael, the archangel, that is a, who is a created being, who is the one who confronts and overcomes. Why is that important? It's telling us that we don't live in a world where good and evil are equal and matched and will oppose one another throughout time and eternity and space and however many other dimensions that you want to go down. No, not at all. That actually, because of that rebellion um, and that spiritual rebellion in heaven because of Adam's rebellion on earth, actually uh, evil is something that's contained within our world and within our, uh, our cosmological existence. It's not eternal. And therefore, the reason uh, Revelation gives us, 12 gives us such hope is saying a day will come when that is gone, when the final victory is achieved. We don't have to worry that this evil and this suffering is going to be our eternal experience. It's just the here and now. And it's important that we, begin, we hold on to that particular perspective. Uh, let me tell you, uh, just uh, a f it was quite a few years ago, uh, I visited Berlin. And one of the things uh, I did, it was you know, a few years ago, it was 1991. Uh, and one of the saddest moments was actually going to the grave of a young man who was shot on the night that the Berlin Wall uh, was pulled down. Uh, had he lived, had he waited an hour longer, he probably would still be alive. It's difficult, isn't it? It's no comfort whatsoever to the, the grieving parents of uh, that young man that actually the wall is now down. Because what they want more than anything else is they want their son. And that's fully understandable. But yet also there is that sense in which knowing that the wall has come down does bring comfort because it tells them that that needless kind of death is actually not going to continue anymore. It doesn't make it easier, but it also somehow it's a reassurance. And I think that that's just a really, really good thing to, to do, isn't it? Just to hold on to at this particular time. That it's not that God is incapable of doing anything, but actually, God has. And just in the sense that, 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 that the coming down of that wall led to reunification um, for the German people, then what we see too is actually that that, that, that barrier that, 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 that the Satan has put in the way uh, between us and God, that is so much part of, of our human existence because of, uh, in a sense, Adam's disobedience and the way that affects us. But what God is saying is, there will come a day when that's gone, when the wall is no longer there, when God and humanity that loves him will be reunited. And that's an eternal perspective that doesn't lessen the pain of what we have to go through now, but it does help us answer the question, well, can God do anything about it? The answer is an emphatic yes, 
He has let me point you to the cross and show you what God has done so that once and for all, uh, Satan and the dragon has been overcome. And so, yes, we live in the final death throes of that struggle. But that struggle will come to an end. Evil is not eternal and pain and suffering are, are conquerable. I think that's just such a helpful perspective to have. Uh, and so when we read these things uh, and we read chapter 2 and we read uh, Revelation 12, uh, put together they encourage us to, to not give up hope, to not lose heart, but to, to endure, to remain faithful, to hang on for that day when the wall of division between God and humanity is visibly down and that we will walk in the city of God. Why today? Why explore this today? I think it's not just because I want to ruin your, your Christmases and bring you back with a, a, a steady dose of reality a couple of days later. Not at all, not at all. Actually, I think this story deepens our understanding of what Christmas is about and deepens our thanksgiving for Emmanuel God with us. You see, it helps us to understand that Jesus isn't just a baby uh, born in a major. Uh, he is the one that God has sent to overcome the world's biggest issues, the world's biggest problems, the world's injustice and pain and suffering and the randomness of it. And God has said, I can look on no more. Let me act decisively once and for all in human history. And that's why this babe will be born. That's why the forces of evil will do everything that they can to destroy this child. Isn't it great to know that that is why Christmas is here? Jesus is here for that. But isn't it good to know too that in a year when, because of COVID, we have uh, many, many people throughout the world have suffered in unimaginable ways to them, in ways that are new and different, and it, it, it's been a year like no other. But actually, in the reality of a world of suffering and pain and anguish, uh, uh, and in a sense, human, humanity's inability at times to respond to things that, that threaten us, isn't it good to know that actually all of this is coming to an end? And Christmas says, this is the hope if you can endure, if you can remain faithful, if you can continue to love. Isn't it great too that as we look with excitement to what 2021 is going to bring and think, my goodness me, isn't it just going to be wonderful to be out of 2020? And doesn't this story too help us in that perspective of Revelation 12, just long for the new heaven and the new earth with a new and deeper longing and say, God, thank you so much that this isn't going to be our existence for all eternity. This isn't the way things are going to be. And Christmas is a pointer to that wonderful new uh, way in which we will be with you and be with one another. And tears are wiped away and suffering and pain and viruses will be gone forever. Wow. I know it's a difficult topic to explore and it has many, many personal aspects that I've not even begun to touch on. But it's hopeful, hopefully that having this kind of framework has help us understand a little bit more about how we face and understand our own struggles and suffering, uh, how we understand what's going on in our world and renews in us faith and hope. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonder of the Christ child. Father, we know that it isn't a, a story that is just uh, about wonderful things and fairies and lights and angels and shepherds but actually goes deep into who we are and our experience as human beings in this broken and fallen world. Father, we pray, even as we struggle with our own personal difficulties and challenges, that somehow this story, which speaks of such terrible loss, 
also points us to the one who brings tremendous hope. And may that hope enlighten our lives and our world, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dominic. Our intercessions this morning are led by Phil Lane, and he'll close by allowing us to say together the Lord's Prayer. A short poem and then a prayer. After the first Christmas, the streets of Bethlehem were deserted now, wind-blown and mournful in a pale dawn after an eventful night. Nobody stirs, even the vendors are late to their wares. The roll-up shutters of the shops are clenched like teeth. A street light flutters and crackles, solitary and forlorn. There is blood on the stones. The innocents have died or gone. The wise have visited and commented and wandered away, seeking their own road home. It's so quiet now. After all the crowds, the golden, noisy, but somehow secret choirs, the broken-hearted farm workers roused to hope and harvest, all gone now. And we are left with the story and the rising light of a new day. What shall we do now? Yes, that is always the real question. Lord God, it's been a difficult year and a strange Christmas, missing relatives, but a celebration despite the sadness, the hope of Christmas, Despite the troubles of the past year and the worries for the future, we thank you that the salvation you brought and the love you give doesn't waver with circumstances or diminish with our troubles. It has always been a light in the darkness and your grace shines brighter with every passing year. We pray for those who have lost those they love to COVID, other illnesses and old age this year. Bless them in their grief. We pray for a year of health, of recovery and hope. We pray for those who have lost employment this year. We pray for a new beginning and work that blesses not just the bank balance, but also the body, heart and soul. We pray for your creation, Lord God, in the climate emergency. We pray that 2021 would be a tipping point, not into disaster, but into healing and recovery. We pray for a true new normal, full of community, hope and health, when nobody is left behind. We greet the new day and the new year with praise for your love and a new commitment to bring good news to everyone we know. Amen. Thank you, Phil. And thank you to everyone who's been part of the service today those on screen and those behind the camera. We conclude our service with that wonderful carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
May the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary, and the peace of the Christ child be yours this Christmas. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Have a good Sunday.